the mind can just do anything and everything that you want it to and uh, i think a lot of it comes with knowing that the choice is yours mm-hmm. you are in control and you make the choices and um, and and sometimes when you don't give yourself any choice mm-hmm. that's when you realize what you're capable of and um, there welcome to the absolutely right podcast i'm your host aditi sarana and this is your show which is india's first graphology or handwriting analysis based leadership show so we invite people every wednesday to talk about their journey share their secrets of being the high performers that they are and i use this phenomenal tool of graphology or handwriting analysis to decode their personalities and the objective is simple when you hear a performer like that when you hear a wonderful leader like that talking about their journey, me and the process is decoded for you you learn where you need to begin what you need to change and how can you claim the best version of yourself and that thought is fascinating today's guest on the show is a personification of everything that we keep talking about and as we walk into this journey in today's conversation you'll know why i'm saying she is the recipient of the prestigious arjun award she was considered former world's number 16 in her game apana represented india twice in the games of olympics she shares her record in the game of badminton with the legendary mr prakash padukone by achieving nine consecutive national championship awards now you can imagine how phenomenal her journey has been please welcome Aparna Popat, who is a player, a mother, a wonderful, wonderful orator, and you'll know when she shares her journey and, in an open, really, really simple manner, explains how you can imbibe the phenomenal rules of the game that she plays in your everyday life. Cannot wait to dive deep in this conversation with Aparna. Let's get started. Hi, Aparna. Welcome to the Absolutely Right podcast. I am thrilled to have you on this conversation because we always talk to high performers and try and understand why they behave the way they do, why they make the decisions that they do. And I believe in your career and as a person that you are, you have studied the the mechanism behind it as a hobby, as a profession, as as a lifestyle. So I'm keen. I'm curious. And over to you. I can't stop talking. It seems. No, I think I'm I'm really excited, and I must also admit a little bit nervous. Um, <laughs> we have never done an interview like this before, where you know usually you're the one talking and saying things, but actually to have feedback coming back from the other end is it's it's as I said it's interesting, but also you know I, I mean I can't wait. I'm just excited. Okay, I will make sure that the nervousness goes away as we ease into the conversation. But little bit of it is nice, as you know. You know, I think it's always like a performance pressure that works well. For most people, now as they say, now once the exam paper is in front of you, then the nervousness goes. It's only yeah. up till then. Now that you've started, I think I should be okay. Okay, perfect. Now when I as we asked you to write a, a handwriting sample, which is on a blank sheet of paper, and we said write in a spontaneous manner, write whatever comes to your mind, and there was a reason why we were so specific about it. When you do not have any ruled a book or any line to guide you. you actually make better choices in terms of the writing sample you make choices that are more connected to your physical movement and you have to choose every single letter giving away deeper information about your personality so the first thing that comes to my mind and i am referring to the capital letter i but we call it personal pronounced i where you write the the word like i am in a sentence so that particular i am referring to if you have your handwriting sample please look at it yeah i do mm-hmm. so when you write that ppi or personal pronounced i you only write a vertical line without any horizontal lines there it is a sign of a person who is highly independent every time you make decisions every time you connect with people no matter what other people are saying around you in the moment you take feedback you hear their opinions and their views but when it comes to the final call it is always yours and many times you actually go against the current you do things that are unpleasant according to other people but you stick to it and you deal with all the consequences that it brings over to you yeah i think that's pretty accurate that is how it um, 
really is. I think, uh, you know, I don't take decisions uh, very spontaneously. As you said, you know, I do listen to, uh, you know, other points of view as well. And then um, basically the thing with me is, right, I need to believe, uh, you know, what I'm doing. I find it really hard to um, sort of think one thing in my mind and act another. And I just can't do that. So um, the, the way I found to deal with it is really if you take your own decisions, then you learn to own them. Mm -hmm. uh, you, it, it could be the right decision. They could be the wrong decision, but it doesn't matter. As long as you've taken it with the best possible intent at that point in time. And um, yeah, I mean, I've made so many mistakes along the way and taken so many wrong decisions, but it's fine. Uh, you know, it, I'd rather just take the decision and then, uh, you know, see what, what it has in store. So it has to be your decision more than anything else for you. You have to be conv convinced about it completely. Yeah, I have to be convinced about it. I, I really like to know the why. I think it's happened, uh, you know, when I was very young as well, when I was training with my coach and uh, he would tell me, you know, this is how you have to play a particular shot. And I right. say, why? And he said, because da, 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 da. And I said, no, but that's not how I think about it. Because when I'm playing, I have a different sort of uh, reasoning, you know, behind. Re yeah, reasoning behind it. And uh, and he would actually, and I was very lucky to have a coach who would answer all my okay. questions. And he'd sit me down and he'd say, uh, you know, this is why I said it. But in case, you know, you feel your way is better, come out and try it and uh, see if it works. And uh, so, so I'm also a little stubborn, okay? So, you know, because I've <laughs> said me this. Let me say that, of, wait. <laughs> So, so I said, let me try, let me try and make this work because I've taught it. Hmm. So, you know, practically, does it work or not? So you get on court, you hit the shot, you're very uncomfortable playing it, but you're desperately trying to make it work. Um, and then you step off court, wait for those five minutes and then, you know, tell sir, I think you were right. <laughs> and, and I'll do it your way. So, you know, there's, there's no qualms about admitting in oh. the end that you're wrong but mm -hmm. i think just to know very clearly that you've given it your best shot and uh, yeah sometimes it, as i said you could be right sometimes you could be wrong but now yeah, no, you know no, the as we're talking about your journey and you know uh, as a training tell tell us why you chose this path and how difficult or easy was it for you to just get started on this journey you know i i don't think there was any thinking involved whatsoever i just love to play and um, for me you know being around sport and playing sport was was home for me i just felt so comfortable um and i could probably be myself i think there's no other space that i found at least yet that i could completely be myself and be at ease and uh, for me sport See, it's it's very odd, right? Sport is perceived to be a very competitive field right. in itself. There's win and lose all the time, right? Um, but I'm not a competitive person by nature. So really, it, yeah, That's it was so all, yeah, it was just all about being there, being around people, focusing, you know. In and I would go into this very sort of meditative state when I was playing sport. Like everything was shut out around me. Um, and, you know, speaking of badminton in particular, I think it was one sport that sort of it, my personality fit into it in, in a way, because I played singles. So I was on my side of the court doing sure. my own thing, individual, independent, there yeah. was independent <laughs> individual, there was no, you know, no body contact. There was, you know, it, it was all pretty and peaceful. And uh, <laughs> in, in that sense, I didn't have to talk too much to anybody. I had to come, I had to observe, I had to, you know, uh, internalize, I had to right. do my own thing. Um, I love to focus very hard. I, I, if there's one thing I can do is like focus for very long periods of time. Right. So, you know, whether it was sport or, and then of course, carried on to academics as well. Mm -hmm. I could easily study eight to 10 hours at a stretch without getting. Wow. Okay. So, um, superpowers. Yeah, I mean, that's just what it was. And for me, that's, you know, sport sort of let me do that and let me focus um, in, in that sense. So, yeah, I think the sport chose me uh, in, in a way because making a career and all was, I mean, didn't even think about it. Okay, actually. you just wanted to go with the flow and you kept enjoying it. No, a non-sporting family, we didn't even know it. And at that point, when I started playing, badminton was not a part of the Olympics. So, oh, okay. um 
yeah there was no real you know goal sort mm-hmm. of to achieve um, mm-hmm. it was more about learning and enjoying myself i played 7 days a week when i was in school so i was in this routine you know and uh, yeah it was all, all about learning experimenting um, and and never really and again i didn't like attention okay okay if if um, you ask me what's the worst part of my sporting career i would say it's the prize distributions really yeah. oh my god I, i don't know so many people who would say but that is a moment where the whole world recognize how cool i was and here you are no it was like you know you're sitting in the chair and then your name is announced and then you have to get up from your chair and then walk all the way to the dais and then take the award pose for that picture and all i <laughs> i just hated it like i'd finish my match and i tell my mom let's go and okay. she'd be like are you but you know this is not <laughs> this is not what you're supposed to do and this is not polite you know right uh, you might want to do it but you got to stay on and and i would i am so tempted here i have to interrupt you i look into your writing to talk about introversion as a nature and we speak about this many many times in when it comes to analyzing people but the simplest thing is any writing that moves to the left side you know the slant of the writing is to the left side is a clear cut sign of somebody who is an introvert and your writing consistently is is to the left side you call, make sure that every single formation every single letter has a tilt towards the left and that is a sign of somebody who exactly everything that you describe you know no physical contact loves to focus go deeper in the work that you do uh, always um, you know socializing selectively if possible with nobody you know hiding away from any any kind of spotlight all of that comes from the left slant and it's so beautiful to see as you're describing and i'm like oh my god i have to i have to like let her finish but that is so true your handwriting exactly says the same thing yeah so so aditi actually here this is where you know i should ask you because this is you know where i feel there's a bit of a struggle right right now yeah. um, the whole world is out on social media i can imagine and, and they believe you know unless you put yourself out there you know you're not going to you're not going to be noticed or you're going to be forgotten or you know in in that sense and um this is something that you know maybe you can throw light on with sort of my nature and when you see my handwriting it's such a struggle um, for me and you know my mom always says this and she used to um say this in gujarati she said bole na ber bechai okay What so which which really means that only if you if um this a seller you know is shouting out for to sell his wares his wares get sold otherwise, otherwise they nobody would know about it yeah otherwise nobody would know and she's like you know you've got to go out there and say something and i'm like it's okay i don't get it you know so but i want to ask you what is that that you want to say because when it was important for you to play the game and when the game was bigger than everything else you did everything around it including going on the stage and collecting the the prize and and posing for the picture because the game mattered so if you go and just to answer your question if you think about ever in your life that i got to be out there you will always feel uncomfortable and that's your nature you cannot you know you cannot mold certain parts of your personality so better you embrace it accept it and go around it is what i keep saying and i feel this question is beautiful especially as your first question i think we can dive deeper here the point is the very moment you realize me being out there can get me closer to the bigger picture then you probably would just deal with this discomfort and go about it and just do it but if the message the actual act is not that powerful then the the act of only being out there only to show up on social media going to not going to be your easiest thing to do so what yeah. do you want to say yeah so you know when and and in fact um, you know my daughter asked me this the other day and she said you know mama you say you're so shy and everybody tells me that you were so shy when you were a, a young kid like me but then how did you go out and stand on court you know with the whole stadium watching you and and then you're playing so you I, should be shy then you know how did you play <laughs> so i i you know that sort of made me think and i said yeah you know she's right but it it at that point in time it never mattered whether they were you know 100 exactly. pairs of eyes looking at you or a thousand exactly. it it just all faded away but um here and and the thing is i always had a weapon i had a racket <laughs> my weapon was my racket but now now that i don't have a weapon right that i can make a point 
<laughs> like I can be there without saying anything, hmm. but I can still make my my point loud and clear. So uh, I would say pen is a, pen is mightier than the sword. So you never know what weapon you have right now and what can you create with your thoughts and your your ideologies and your concepts that otherwise people haven't heard. So it is yeah. not always about uh, you know having that physical act of it. And I know you were lucky enough to hide behind the physical act of the game. to not show up and not speak about things and you expressed yourself still if you pick up something like that that form where you can do it even now that would be great but if not and if you want to choose to be more vocal about your views and you know we have so many uh, things that i want to talk about the way you look at life and sports together now if you think that people can get benefited and if you genuinely feel that is what you're passionate about i feel when you would sit down and that why will become crystal clear i think you will be unstoppable again right now and as i'm looking at your writing probably last 5 to 7 years you've been thinking what is worth your time you're thinking what is worth the effort of actually going out there and talking to people and until and unless you are not convinced nobody can nobody can convince you so people can talk about their views their ways right things to do wrong things to do but that conviction if it is missing it is almost impossible for you to step into that zone and do anything yeah i think that that's just amazingly accurate and you even got the timeline actually right it has been like about 5 to 7 years uh, you know where i've literally been looking see the thing when when you played sport and i'm not talking about the accolades or anything is mm-hmm. just the way you immersed yourself um, in into it i think that sense of purpose right. has been so strong and uh, the effort has been so strong like you know it's not a single day that you know you've shirked work or you know you've you know sort of given less than 100% no no matter what no matter and i want to ask you about and... this like how do you manage to continue that journey you know like so many people talk about achievements and i want to talk about the transition after that but as a, as a commoner i think we always have the this question for the royalties of people who are into sports and olympians like you like literally how do you continue that routine and i have read so many books and i i love reading and studying about uh, the biographies of people who have achieved their their you know highest possible potential how do you continue to show up for your practice show up for your routine show up for every single thing every single day like seven days a week yeah you know as as they say right enthusiasm is common but endurance is rare mm-hmm. and um, it's it's just about uh, about getting better for me it was very simple that i just wanted to be better and be as perfect as possible not because of an extra not because people were watching me not because people were judging me but i was happiest when i did things well mm-hmm. it's as simple as that and um also with that i think what was very important for me is see okay and and my sister jokes about this and says you know you've been playing badminton since you were 8 years old yeah. and i come and watch a match of yours and you still hit a service out you think how is it possible like you've been doing the <laughs> same thing over the years you know and you still make an elementary mistake like this you know and and that's what you is say she, that you know is she your younger sister no she is my older sister okay So, I'm just asking because sisters have this knack. I have a younger one. They just yeah. find the most, <laughs> the stupidest thing that we do, and they just want to smear it in our faces for some. <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 a great. Uh, again, you know, people say these random things, and I I really find humor in a lot of it, and I give it back. So I'm not one to you know sort of <laughs> take it like you would have got you know you know five back in in return <laughs> for that one, but. Uh, it it also makes me think and that's what i say you know you introspect so much and you internalize and say is it yeah, damn she's right you know it's just a serve i'm standing in the same place you know i just have to hit the <laughs> shuttle from this side to that side and i'm still making an error but anyway the point being is that there's so much repetition involved in the sort of field uh, that that i was in and uh, you've got to make it interesting for yourself you've got to put those challenges in for yourself and whether it means um today say i've hit 10 shots in a row mm-hmm. and tomorrow i want to hit 12 then you go on and you and i feel like you don't need to tell anyone about that goal you just challenge yourself it's your own challenge if you don't do it that's fine but just give it your best and 
that's sort of what kept me going. I mean, how do, there were three things that I always believed. One is do more. Okay. Okay. Do better or do different. Okay. Can if I could consistently you? do these, you know, or do anything in with falls in either of these brackets, then you will be getting ahead. Then at least your so competition. So you got to make sure that you, you do more or, yeah. or you do better. Or, okay. Yeah. yeah. Or do different. Okay. But how do yeah. you know this? How do you know? Like, you know, sometimes uh, you can be obsessed with the idea and then you keep doing more and more and probably keep doing the same mistake over and over again. So, so good, good you brought that up. I've done that. And I'll, I'll tell you this really funny instance. So I was um, around, uh, I think, 16 years old and I was playing the under 19. Uh, and uh, so in, I think it was the finals mm -hmm. and um, there was this particular shot that I started playing in one game so a game was 11 points back then mm -hmm. and i hit the shot and it went in the net and i hit it again and it went in the net believe it or not i hit the same shot in one game seven times all seven times the shuttle went in the net and fell down same spot huh? duck 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 i lost the match and i came out and my coach is like have you gone crazy what were you trying to even do and I said, no, I hit the shot correctly. And he said, Are he said, it's going in the net. So I said, no, I could see, but I still hit the shot correctly. And, uh, and I walked off. And um, he was like, you know, what is this? You know, what is she even saying? She's lost a match. She's not bothered. She comes out, you know, so uh, in a way, very cocky in that sense to say, you know, Defined I've done what I, true. you know, I, what I did, I did well. And um, believe it or not, after that, um, when they went and measured the net, the net was two inches high on that side of the... Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And um, and then, so when I came out and I told sir, see, I said, sir, I told you, I, I hit the right shot. And it, all those points were mine because the opponent wasn't near the shuttle. And he just looked at me and he said, you fool, you lost the match. Mm. You know, so... Yeah, I think sometimes you learn yeah. from situations like this. It's, it's a sort of lesson that I've never forgotten. But I I played both ways. One way, you know, you look at it and say, you know, you were so confident that, you know, in your abilities that you did the right thing and you did it the right way. Right. But in the larger picture, you lost out. So you, you won the battle but lost the war kind of. Right. So, um, yeah, I, th I think it's a great lesson to learn. Yeah, and it's a great, great, great story to remember because uh, in, in my coaching experience, I always tell people this favorite question that I, I have and, you know, it's applicable to any situation. I ask people to ask themselves, what do I require to do here? And sometimes what is right to be done, what is wrong to be done, you know, that is what, what I desire to do. We have so many forces that are playing out. But if you can just sit down there and ask yourself, what do I require to do? Sometimes we do stand in our own ways while trying to make things right. And what you said is so beautiful. And I'm going to remember this story because we want to do it right. And we want to be the believers of our dreams, but that might not work always in a larger game. So thank you. Yeah. You know, I think here, you know, just to take it a little further from what you said, you know, to do the right thing. And uh, I would also say sometimes, you know, to get the job done, um, what, I feel what has really sort of um, stood in my way is actually making the compromise, mm -hmm. not um, for ego or not for any other reason, but more because um, of values Right. that you don't believe that this is the right thing to do. Sure. Um, who's to decide what is right and what is wrong? Different. But if you have a certain set of values and, you know, somebody tells you that, you know, if you you know, at the other end is this big pot of gold, mm -hmm. but you've got to compromise certain of your values and, you know, uh, ethics. And I, that's something I just can't do. Uh, and I also feel like this is who you are. And the fact that you are willing to pay the price for being the person that you are makes you so different and so strong in that sense. And, you know, it was, and I'm going to say this, I'm, I'm taking the risk of saying it, but let me say it as it is, as it is. You have been lucky to have this profession where you actually stepped into the passion that you had and it worked out. 
now after having done the complete run when you turn back and look at things that you got to adapt and change and alter to the so called real world where those rules are not applicable and everything is pretty much all over the place and instead of playing the game that you're playing currently we had a guest last week on the show harsha and he spoke about how life is an infinite game where there are no rules technically and we think that there are rules but they're not and there are and this is where the problem happens but you can always recreate and rebuild yourself so i was i read this quote in the morning again and i was thinking about it conversation context if we got to change the rules if you got to play a new game altogether then the construct the values the rules that we walk in with might be different and thereby we probably require to not change your values but look at the game in a different manner i feel somewhere and as i'm looking at your writing and we also had a short conversation yesterday about the transition which is the toughest part and i also want to tell our listeners the transition might not be from one career to another it could be from one situation to another uh, one role to another from one department to another so all of us go through multiple transitions in our lives and the discussion that we're going to step into right now will be applicable in every situation like that so over to you yeah you know absolutely i think um, there's there's a sort of distinction according to me between adapting mm-hmm. and and compromising and, and what do you and, think is a distinction Yeah so i i think adapting is um sort of seeing what is in front of you like remaining the same person that you are in a way with, as in value wise but doing things uh, that you've never done before like say say for me for example um when i was in school uh i couldn't hold a mic and stand up and face my my entire school and uh, that was one of the reasons i didn't stand for head girl actually uh, when, when i was in school because uh, we were required to give a speech in front of the whole school and i said no chance uh, this has been <laughs> that is just absolutely not happening i would i i let go of that opportunity but um now if i have to do it like if i you know when i did sit as the executive director of the olympians association of india and you have to stand up and speak on behalf of you know the entire olympian sort of community in the indian olympians i, I would do it is you know you adapt and then you just get the job done okay. but but if you you know told me to do that while saying something that is is not uh, entirely true then i would not be able to hold that mic and stand up there and talk okay. about it and so, according to you that is compromise yeah that would be a compromise mm-hmm. but adapting i would do um, if it's required and i have actually you know over mm-hmm. over a period of time in my life and uh, which i'm absolutely okay with and that's what life is all about is fun yeah. um so that is somewhere you know where i felt okay so i'll give you another example right so when um, i stopped playing competitive uh, badminton and i worked at indian oil corporation mm-hmm. um in fact i went in and i told them i said you know i don't want to play badminton anymore and i'd hurt my wrist in any case but i could have still you know stayed at home for about 6 months try to figure myself out and i literally gave myself like 10 days and okay. you know went they submitted an official letter and say um please decategorize me which really means so when you're in the sports category and then you put in a request to get decategorized to the general employee category and then you know your career sort of goes along like any other employee in the organization and um at that point i was you know two time olympian you know nine time national champion had the record had all my commonwealth games medals you were still in the papers you know it was all quite fresh and um i think the first day at work you know i'll never forget because um my boss he said i said so you know where do i sit what do i do and he said acha you start by making photocopies here is a you know bunch of documents <laughs> and um, it was absolutely okay you know there was a, no uh i i didn't feel like a loss of identity in that sense so you know it was very coolly adapting i didn't have to compromise i didn't have to sort of um, i was still the ego battle yeah there's no ego battle i mean i've stood outside offices you know for so long so may i come in he said no in a meeting so you're just standing outside with that file you know get you know waiting for the approval to come in and uh, absolutely okay i don't think there was a single day where you know i felt like you know 
is, is beneath also in yeah, some way. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, there are a couple of things that I've sort of um, lived my life by. The one, one is to say that there will always be people who are better than you sure. at something, no, no matter what it is. Um, I think you learn from everywhere. Not everyone has everything, sure. um, which, which I'm absolutely okay with. And uh, really be happy with what you have while working for what you want. So I have two Any... questions. Uh, I read your story where you were injured and you were like struggling and your entire team and people around you came to support you in ways you couldn't have imagined from your coach to people around you. Now, when you were going through that pain, what was the single most thing? Like, I know you wanted to win the game. That could be the, the outcome. But what kept you going in that journey when it was so painful and you were almost struggling to brush your teeth, which is like for a player like you, it's such a disaster to happen before the match. Um, I think it was just a challenge. It was a challenge to, um, I, I really believe in the strength of the mind. Mm -hmm. And it was for me, I think the ultimate challenge in a way, because um, it's, it's strange how much your mind can really Tell us happen. more about what happened for our listeners to know and have a better context. Okay, so um, I started developing this wrist pain, um, say around 2005 or so. And uh, it's it sort of came like a shock initially in my wrist and I didn't pay too much heat to it. And it, it went away, um, you know, and then I didn't feel it for another three months or so. And you know, I actually even forgot about it. And then slowly over a period of time um, the pain would sort of come every month mm -hmm. and then uh, it started coming you know every fortnight and then every week and as as it started getting more intense it started staying on uh, for longer periods of time so initially it would just come and go and within like say 10 minutes the pain would be gone then that pain became like an hour and then a day and then towards the end it was like if the pain came in um, it, it would stay on for a week at least oh my God. and um, it would be so painful that it started affecting my day-to-day -day activities in the sense uh, I could not drink tea uh, you know holding the mug in my right hand I would hold it in my left hand I could not drive my car which means I was sort of dependent on friends to drive me to training and back um, when the pain was really bad I could not tie my hair into a ponytail um, which means I couldn't wash my hair I couldn't you know, then brush my teeth. I started brushing my teeth with my left hand. Um, started doing a lot of things that I, if I didn't have to do it with my right hand, I would just, I just switched to my left because mm -hmm. I said, let me protect my wrist as much as possible so that I can train as much as possible and continue playing. Um, in this time, uh, we went to a lot of doctors, got the MRIs, got the scans done. Nothing showed up. Um, you know, to, to an extent, I think also a few people thought that I was making it up and it was all in my mind and, you know, right. and, and all that. So we, we were trying to fight off, you know, that was disbelievers in, in a way as well. But, um, you know, in, in the end, it was just um, the I had to play my ninth national championship, which was if I had won that, I would set a record equaling that of uh, my mentor, Prakash Padukone. Okay. And... Uh, before the tournament, I was practicing once a week. Mm -hmm. And when I say once a week, wasn't even practicing fully because I was just playing the softer strokes. And so I would say, at least you keep your legs moving, you know, at least, you know, you just be on court. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that and I was going for physio every day. The physio uh, very honestly admitted to me, she said, Aparna, I have no clue how to treat you. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just doing this with all my heart because I really believe, you know, that, you know, you should be out there and you should be playing. And um, I said, you know, ma'am, you just do whatever you have to do. I'm here. Don't worry. And I remember the last session before the tournament started where she clearly told me, she said, can I tell you something? So I said, yeah, sure, go ahead. She said, uh, you know, I don't think you're going to be able to play this tournament fully because it involved playing seven days back to back. Right. And uh, she said, you won't even be able to come to me for physio or whatever. So whatever we've been doing all these days will come to a, a stop. Right. And I just looked at her and I said, you don't worry. Uh, um, I've got this. Mm -hmm. Why I said that, I have no idea. <laughs> but went back and uh, 
you know, I think it was just constantly on my mind. Mm-hmm. You know, this very positive thing that says that, you know, just give it everything you have. Mm-hmm. Like if if it, you know, means, you know, you have to set yourself on fire, just set yourself on fire. That's it. Um, and uh, yeah, come the tournament, uh, the first few rounds I adapted again, you know, in the sense I stopped serving forehand, I started serving backhand because it was less stress on my it's a lot of my opponents thought was strategy it wasn't <laughs> i was just yeah i just pretended you know that it was yeah. yeah i was fully undercover <laughs> and uh, um, as it so happened i didn't i couldn't play my best so through the tournament there were murmurs and there were whispers and then it was out in the media saying aparna is not at her best um, we're gonna have a new national champion this year after a period of eight years and all that and i just read all that and i was just so calm oh God, and okay. i said you know it, it's okay and, and it was a time when Saina Nehwal was coming up mm. um, so I'd beaten her in the, in the two nationals before that but this time she was you know sort of this and, and she sort of was quite confident and I was like you know don't worry as long as the pain doesn't come back now nah, then I'm, I'm fine I just mm. have to ensure that that pain doesn't come and um, yeah I had close matches people said oh she's she almost lost and all that but um, coming to the finals, there it was just so many strokes I played with instinct. I can't tell you. Oh my god! Um, just instinct, uh, hitting shots that I've never hit before, um, getting them right. You know, winning that ninth consecutive national title, walking out to a standing ovation. Um, I'm getting and, goosebumps hearing this. This is yeah, and, and I think it was just destiny because the next morning I woke up. With a pain in my wrist. No way! Oh my god! Yeah. Oh my god! And I would, I would actually through the tournament sleep with a crepe bandage on my hand and put my hand under the pillow, so you know that inadvertently I don't move it around. And uh, you know, when the pain came back the next morning, I was like, just so grateful, um, you know, yeah. for what happened. And uh, again, it was more not about that record. It wasn't about you know anything was just about that I did it a very simple sort of message to self like Mm -hmm. note to self Mm -hmm. put your mind to it you can do it that's it wow so I have another question you mentioned that when you chose to decategorize yourself in in, at your job what was the motivation to keep going then so along with that decategorization letter when I met the DGM and uh, he said you know, up in a, naturally there's space in the sports section. Mm-hmm. And I said, sir, that is why I'm here. I'm here to request you to put me in any other section but sport. And he said, you know, what are you even saying? Because yeah. your expertise lies in sport. And um, I said, I've done this long enough. Uh, I want to learn different things. And uh, I, I remember telling him, I said, you put me in training and aviation and you put me anywhere else. I don't mind. Um, but just give me a break from sport and uh, he was really nice and he said I I don't want you to leave my department so I'll keep you in you know the admin department and in the HR but um, okay I'll give you another role and I said gladly you give me whatever and as long as it's different I'll I'll take it up and no this is why why I'm I'm going back to the story because what I see in your writing, and I'm going to give some graphological insights before I move in here. Now, when we look at a lowercase letter M, and there are two hump formations. If the second hump is taller than the first one, that makes a person a perfectionist. Okay, and that does not mean always the most positive thing that people think it is. It also comes with like, I got to deliver my best no matter what. So there is this intensity with which the person functions. When it, that intensity is channelized, you are killing it. You are going for it. You are like you know going to the next level. When the channel is not as as applicable as it was for you before this, it turns inward, and then the perfectionist starts finding ways in which it can perfect things that are that that do not require perfection, that do not require improvement. So it becomes like the the monster that starts fighting within. Now, if I have to talk about the three things that I was making notes while you were talking about it, first is, are you intrigued in any way 
in the things that you're doing and i know you're doing a bunch of things currently but is there anything that intrigues or piques your interest more than any practical reason because if that is not the case for you as a person it is impossible to pretend and as you can't pretend as you cannot convince other people of your interest when it is not there probably we have to sit down <laughs> and take score of that reality and say okay am i genuinely with my heart on my my hand on my heart am i genuinely intrigued by the the situation that's one second one is you do not know anything as a balanced approach you're in or you're out you're 100% or you're zero and with a binary personality that you are every time you try to convince yourself main thoda kar leti hu i'll just give it do it a bit so that the people would be okay you don't understand it because you don't know what that 100 looks like in many areas that you are involved in right now and you're waiting for things to give you that intensity to give you that that challenge your way so that you can apply yourself you can literally engage to a point where you will know that you have given your best shot okay so we have to sit down and look for stimulation we have to look for the everything that the thing can consume it is not that you are okay or not okay it's about the areas that you're picking up they do not have the possibility for you to be intense unfortunately intensity is the only way you understand the game so so what is that stimulating thing that you think is still challenging for you um you know honestly i don't know and and you're absolutely right i think this is what i'm sort of looking for because um and you know to, to a certain extent i think the advantage also that i feel that i have with sport is that i've had now sort of a 360 degree view right. of what sport is right. because been you know started as a player and then you know as i mentioned you know got into indian oil so i did sports administration there um then got into coaching and mentoring after that uh sat on government committees so you're involved with federations in in that sense um and and the government of india and then did commentary did tv commentary uh, did did a bit of writing um you know you're on tv news you do you know i did the ted talk um, yeah, i want to say the and, the mentoring part where you as a motivational speaker you spoke at different forums yeah that too and then uh, supported social causes so um sort of seen sport in a very different light mm-hmm. and um, i think all of them and this is where i really struggle because i've enjoyed doing all of this <laughs> and you you sort of you sort of um, understand things differently when you connect experiences together in mm-hmm. sport because as an athlete i would probably you know say what are the administrators doing they should do better but now that you've been an administrator yourself you, you understand can sort of be more yeah sympathetic or you know understand it a little more so you can play a good balancing act and i feel um that is an advantage in itself but after a period of time as you said that intensity like you you know a lot about a lot of things right. um again which is good but um, yeah there's there's that one hook that i'm looking for and uh, you know that intensity that you know you can go in deeper and sort of um gain expertise in 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 that sense so yeah i, I honestly i haven't found what that is yet i'm still so, looking you know it's like what i'm seeing as a as a pattern as a requirement and i'm also seeing that because when you write your letter t and h the letter t is shorter than the letter h in most cases that is a sign of a chronic learner if i have to use the word somebody who cannot stop learning no matter where you go how how you look at things you walk into the kitchen you learn something new you walk into a conversation you learn something new new and if it is not providing you the platform to learn and go to the next level you get bored very very quickly you also have a letter y where you start the stroke you go 50% and you leave the stroke halfway now that is a sign for somebody who the very moment loses challenge to this excitement stops executing whatever they are doing and whatever cost it brings or consequences they deal with it 
Now to make it simpler, if you are interested in the game, you'll do everything. But for you, it is not consistency that matters. These are actually shorter learning curves that matter to you a lot. So every game, every practice, you learn something new and that's why you could practice seven days a week. If they would have genuinely asked you to repeat the same routine without you learning anything new, you couldn't have sustained it. So it looks like consistency to, to the world. But if I take a deeper look and deeper understanding in your brain, I would say it's not consistency, but these are actually short learning curves. Luckily, you had everyday new learning curve when you're playing and practicing. Yes. No, and now, absolutely. And now because you don't have them, and now because of whatever they throw at you, you just consume and you learn and you get done with it. This is where the boredom is is so so thick and you absolutely can't break through that yeah also also as you mentioned no, i i let it go i i'll switch off mm. i i have that ability like if no matter what if i have to switch off i'll just switch off which is I great think it's i think what we are looking at right now is what keeps you on because yeah, switching off yeah. is a super power that you have also with introversion, <laughs> like relationships, conversations, you can just switch off. And people are like, what happened? Like, is she not dependent on us? And you're like, no, actually, you don't know this, but I'm not dependent on anybody for that matter. Yesterday, when we were speaking, you spoke about some beautiful lessons that you can share with our listeners. And you said there are stories attached. I'm all ears to hear what can our listeners, you know, have your wisdom on. Um. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it is, you know, what we've spoken about and uh, these experiences that I've had, um, you know, the first, of course, you know, since we've been talking about having a personality and be staying true to your personality in, right. in a lot of ways and uh, being yourself and being authentic. I think, um, yeah, I think I've by and large managed to uh, do that. And today, when I look back on my career uh, in sport i think one of the biggest lessons i have learned is that you can win um by being who you are because because there are many ways to win wow. and uh, you know i always sort of looked at what was comfortable for me hmm. and uh, now that you see so many other champions emerging uh, in badminton and across different sports and then you look at them and it's just so different from you mm. but they still come out and win True. and i think the appreciation of that that you can actually be your best self um, you know when you're most comfortable and you're most comfortable when you are true to, to yourself you know, to yourself and just being very honest with yourself is something that has held me in good stead and uh, I can't agree with you more because when I look at handwritings my only attempt is to introduce the person to himself or herself because there are things that we miss in the whole rigmarole of going about life and everything and when somebody can hold mirror to intangible thing like your personality you discover deeper aspects and I think that's fascinating I, I agree with you. yeah I, I you know um it, it's also that I've, I've tried, you know, when, when you're in school and you're under so much pressure to, uh, you know, be different things and try mm. different things. And uh, I remember this point in school where the grunge look was in and uh, me being, you know, very <laughs> particular about, uh, you know, the way I looked or, uh, you know, not, not fancy, but mm. just neat, right. just to turn up presentable in that sense I actually went like for the grunge look I remember uh, you know people actually giggling and laughing and uh, you know all 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 that jazz like honestly went out and bought a Levi's pair of jeans that were like two sizes too big for me really and then they'd, like, like, hang <laughs> that off was your me. grunge <laughs> that was that was and then they did all that rubbish um, you know and just badminton wise I remember this one instance again these are lessons that you don't forget um so I was always taught never to argue uh, with the opponent and never to argue with the line judge and never to argue with the chair umpire. And this one instance, I had lost to this particular player like some six, seven times in a row. Mm -hmm. My senior, so I was playing, you know, somebody uh, older. But again, I, I was very frustrated and I said, what is going on? And now let me try, you know, arguing for the shuttle. I said, this shuttle. So every time she would say the shuttle is all right, I would say it's not all right. 
<laughs> and uh, and you know just in that very annoying and then after the end of that whole match i realized the person who got most annoyed was me and i still went and <laughs> lost <laughs> so, so it wasn't productive for you to to use that strategy of arguing yeah, Yeah, it wasn't me. It wasn't my nature to sort of argue. I'd rather just accept it and find a solution to it rather than, you know, sort of try to be someone I'm not. So I think that that is one thing that I clearly believe: be authentic. And if there's one thing that I I I feel that I cannot handle very well is people not being authentic. I I don't know why. I mean, it just gets under my skin for some for some reason. Um, but anyway, that's. that there are many different kinds in this world and and that's all right um the second i believe is like it never gets easier you only get better and um, this is come from um, me like if i look at the national titles that i've won so my career really started by winning the first nationals that i participated in which mm-hmm. was under 12 and i won a national title in the singles every year till i retired save one year so that was about 16 titles in 17 years mm-hmm. so pretty Some much consistency yes it's a i mean pretty much remaining unbeaten um at a time you know and producing your best mm-hmm. at that moment when it's required in that one week of the year every year for 17 years um you know it there could have been just so many things that were up that could have gone wrong gone wrong of course but they didn't and uh, i i think from that I just realized that it didn't get easier when i played my first national there was a challenge that you know would i win would i not um mm. as as we went along you know conditions sort of were different opponents were different they were employing different strategies um perspectives were different when when i started off in the senior section i was you know a youngster so right. not so much pressure and then after that you're constantly defending your title mm. for the next 9 years and uh, so that brings around you know different pressures in itself uh, there was this tournament i remember when i played one of my nationals in lucknow and there was severe food poisoning um, going around and i was also affected and i only ate vanilla ice cream right through that tournament because i could not you know Risky. stomach anything else and i could not even warm up like warm up was tiring me out and uh, somehow you know managed to win that nationals as well so you just have to you know find a way um, and and just keep getting better because you don't know what conditions are going to come in front of you and and the more you sort of prepare for them um, you know that that will hold you in good stead i said do more do better do different any point in time each and every session each and every set of each and every session wow this is what you have to do and if just to take you a little deeper so the way i used to practice um mm-hmm. was if i was doing a sequence of say you know drop and net which is from the back court to the fore court every time i hit a shot at the net there was a feedback to my mind saying could you have taken it little to the left to the right little higher little lower did you hold the racket tight enough was it too soft did it go too high over the net could you have pushed it more were you too close to the shuttle um and imagine doing this for every shot for one hour so this is the kind of sort of um you know practice that uh, you sort of put in if you really want to get better and um i guess every- that is Yeah I think that is something and then in the end commit to it commit like mad um you know as they say you know when there's nothing else left to burn mm-hmm. then um you have to set yourself on fire wow. be prepared to do that and um I think that is something that worked for me and the last and my most favorite topic to talk about is the mind the mind can just do anything and everything that you want it to and uh, I think a lot of it comes with knowing that the choice is yours. Mm. You are in control and you make the choices and um and and sometimes when you don't give yourself any choice mm. that's when you realize what you're capable of. And uh, can you can you speak more about this one? This is power. Yes, so I'll I'll tell you this uh, instance which I haven't really made sense of but um I I know that it's got 
a lot to do with the mind. I was playing um, my senior nationals. Uh, I was I was 16, so I was still a junior, but I was playing the senior nationals. And as I reached Pune for the tournament, um, I had a blister that was like maybe around two inches um, on on the back of my heel, and it was like you know the skin had completely peeled off, and you could see red skin sort of under. It was raw. Um, in that sense and uh, the tournament was scheduled to start in two days so I reached there two days earlier and uh, requested the organizers to allow me to practice in slippers because I couldn't put my shoes on mm -hmm. so I would I would just stand on the court and practice in slippers and um, the team championship was um, two days away and uh, it, you know everyone including me was wondering saying how the wow. hell am I even going to play and um, that evening, in fact, um, I did a session of meditation and uh, there was this, you know, a uh, lot of positive thinking. There was vis visualization and um, also a lot of determination in the sense to say this is the nationals. And for me, nationals used to be sacrosanct. Mm -hmm. uh, so you sort of say that you have no choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I slept that night and... Uh, not the next day, but the day of the match, the blister was gone. No. It 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 had gone. I I have no idea how uh, you know an injury like that could heal right. um, so quickly. I mean, there wasn't even a scar. No and, way. And it, it's a miracle. And it's you did that with your wrist again. In in a way, I mean it. It happened with the wrist again. I it's, I mean, I hadn't practiced two days in a row for you know for at least a month before those nationals, and then I play seven days in a row. Um, so it it sort of happens, and I think the mind really is um, is what makes everything else work. Sure. You know, and um, th there's also this thing about us. You know, you're believing. So sport, there are a lot of emotions, right? right? They happen all the time. And to keep your emotions in check is one of the hardest things that you have to do on the court. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I just did a talk recently on decision making. And uh, as again, I was reading up about it. And it says the emotional mind is five times stronger than its rational counterpart. Absolutely. Five times stronger. And to actually, you know, ward that monkey off is really, really hard. Um, but to be able to do that um, day on day under severe time pressure because you and know, other split pressures. seconds, fine margins, yeah, you know, people looking at you, the media, and it's all happening live, right? Unscripted, there are no <laughs> second, you know, there are no retakes, there are no second chances. And um, it, it's just how you can handle it mentally. Mm. And... Uh, Again, I mean, this is something that really, really intrigues me. Uh -huh. to, you know what? And and all of us are capable of it. Uh -huh. Like literally, I've seen it not not only with myself. I've seen it with friends and family. Um, and I strongly believe that sport is one of the avenues where you just get to practice it more often than anywhere else. Um, and and that's why I strongly believe play sport. Um, everyone should play sport um, just because it gives you so many chances to learn so many things I mean of course you can learn those things elsewhere as well but it just happens so much more frequently on, on the playing field I'm going to so, take that advice I play no sport whatsoever and I have been like a, a practitioner of yoga for many years more than 20 years now and I love it but a sport kind of field I've always for some reason stayed away from and now that you say this I'm like I'm going to think about it and I'm implement this one thank you yeah, you should I think it's it's just a great place to be and as long as um, a lot of people look at sport as win and lose it's it's um, way way deeper of course of course and and uh, you know the way you put it like the games people play it's like it's, it's a book and it's a very famous book of transactional analysis. Now, you, I, I, I understand that you look at the games that are actually being played as, as personalities and people and their choices and decision making, which is fascinating. 
yeah i i think you know if if you really uh, ask me if um, champions and i and you know people who are just intuitive and intelligent as they play there's a lot what to do with reading the opponent mm-hmm. and and when you're sitting out watching a match you're not only watching whether they're hitting a forehand or a backhand or a smash or a toss or a drop you're actually watching why they're doing what they're doing Mm-hmm. and and it sort of gives you a lot of insight in their personality which is again like like you know just give me that little kick when i picked up that graphology book when <laughs> i was a kid um sitting and watching people play also gave me that little kick because then i knew you know now this one is going to start pretending that they are tired <laughs> or you know now this one's going to try and disrupt you know the rhythm of the opponent or at this point uh you know this one's going to get so frustrated that they're going to start hitting smashes for the next three rallies continuously wow. and and when you sort of get that right you no know, you just feel so happy and of course there's so many times <laughs> i've used that when i've been playing against opponents where you know you you know in advance what's going to happen and the anticipation sort of comes from there but yeah it's it's a uh, look that there, there are certain fields where you can't pretend right and sport it, it's sport One is too them. fast for you to to pretend, pretend to be someone you're not <laughs> how nice <laughs> i i love that line i think we're going to make a quote out of this that so many places you can pretend but sport is not that place you can't yeah. do it Absolutely. yeah i mean we we are we are quite good at acting in certain cases <laughs> but when the when the action starts yeah. then um, and when the pressure is on you oh. you you know fall back to your natural self True. and this is applicable uh, in every walk of life it's just exactly. that people are not in that high pressure situations every day so they can exactly. continue the the so called masking for a longer period of time whereas in your field it is not no doubt you cannot handle inauthentic people yeah i i just can't thank you this is wonderful this is amazing uh two things i want to talk about uh, when you write your letter o and a there is no loop inside of it <laughs> that is a there's a clear sign of somebody being clear at heart and being as transparent as they appear to be i think that is your strength here and even if people don't understand and they think that you're very straightforward which again you are because you write your letter t as a cross most of the time and anybody with that pointed bottom at the in the letter t uh, is a straightforward person so you it takes a lot because some of them are little little curved so it takes a lot for you to be polite when you're very clear and very very and you know we know exactly what you want so that time just being polite for the heck of it takes takes a lot of energy <laughs> you know it's it's funny it's funny that you're saying that because as as patient a person as i am and i can be very patient right of course you know not in yeah, as long as people are not being stupid or or pretentious <laughs> Thank you so much Aparna Thank for being on the show this was wonderful. Thank you. Oh my pleasure. I think you've you sort of made me feel very good and also given me a lot to think about and sort of held a mirror back into my face and also put in um to words a lot of things that I couldn't have and I was just thinking so that has just been absolutely amazing and it's going to be so so helpful um and yeah and i will take you up on your challenge thank you yes 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 finally yes <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so much thank you so much for joining me one more time on the absolutely right podcast this conversation was so powerful it was a privilege to talk to aparna the actual conversation went on for 2 hours and it was so tough for us to edit parts out because everything was so meaningful and everything was so exciting so we almost had to to argue and debate internally to keep some parts and to remove some wonderful parts but i believe this was a great conversation if you have a friend or a family member who you think requires to listen to aparna's voice and hear how she did not give up on her journey no matter what then please share this episode with them you know every week when i talk to the community of smart professionals on our mental and emotional gym we talk about how can one work towards that larger idea of claiming the best version of yourself what can you do when you go for a physical workout or join a gym on a regular basis you are working on that strength you're doing things that can help you build the strength the flexibility the muscles that you require but we also require that on a mental and emotional level 
but we don't do much about it. And one fine day, we feel that I have this bout of anxiety. I have this challenge in front of me and my mind is not helping. It's not because you're incapable of doing it. It's mainly because you haven't trained yourself. So join me in this training program, which happens every Saturday for one hour, where we look at the complicated mental concepts in a very, very playful manner and make these concepts relatable, actually something that you can use on a daily basis. Check out the website aptforme.com. If you want to learn more about graphology or how we use high performance coaching or other modules that we offer to take your journey to the next level, you can check my website aditisurana.com. We also have some specific details for our graphology masterclass. Every time we have such conversations, I feel if you get to look at yourself in a different light, things move forward. You do not require always an external person to bring that realization. You are enough to take your journey to the next level. So when you have that moment, when you know that you have a penny drop moment in a conversation like the podcast, take a picture, make a video, share it on Instagram, tag my Instagram handle at Aditi Surana so that I get to see your journey. I get to see what parts are you enjoying. And that would be an amazing thing for other people to discover what we do in a phenomenal manner. Thank you so much for being part of this journey. I'll see you on Friday with one more episode of the Absolutely Right podcast and this time in our graphology series. Till then, happy writing.